you know, take turns showing some work and looking, we're looking for some sort of connectivity and both uh, the work that we've done over a period of time as well as the, some maybe perhaps some connectivity between the two of us. Um, sir, oh, wait, I'm way behind on the slides. Okay. You know, David wrote this um, when? Sometime in the last 40 years. We looked at it a little bit earlier today and kind of tweaked it somewhat, but it was kind of uncanny to some degree that we're both really on these, in these sort of similar kind of paths in the way we make work and the context within, within which we do it. Um, one of the things that uh, I want to start out with is looking for uh, some kind of synthesis in work that's been done either mostly probably, you know, 20 years apart. And, you know, and I, I am doing mostly um, work, uh, you know, explorations, I suppose, within the context of, you know, life living. Uh, Gretchen had asked, um, I think she should ask both of us, uh, who, uh, what are your influences? Who are your influences? And I would say everybody in this room is, uh, everybody that I see in a restaurant or walking down the street. I mean, I'm not necessarily influenced by other artists more so just by you know, the, the living of life. That's, that's what my biggest influence is, and that's what informs my life, and it gets manifested through my work. And so that's sort of uh, where I am. And you know, the piece on, on uh, the left was done, uh, as Tom was said, in, in a, a project in uh, Indonesia. This specifically here was interior Borneo. And then the other project was done for, um, had been represented by galleries in the past and had been done for gallery exhibitions. And I'm looking, you know, not only from a design perspective, uh, we have some forward facing individuals. I think the one individual is probably a little bit more uh, that's on, uh, on your right is probably more of an organic kind of intuitive kind of uh, form. And the other one is you know, they're having a conversation between the other one that, who's probably more mired in the technology of the day, that we're these sort of b data beings. And so it's, it's some kind of, that's sort of idea of living in two worlds. Um, and this is, you know, before dinner, we're having two ock and cigarettes, you know, so it's a different kind of conversation. No, two ock, you guys know what two ock is? It's a rice wine? No, no house goes without it. Uh, also in Borneo, there was, uh, um, there's a, a significant uh, number of Chinese in this one in interior Borneo, this one city, Sintang, which is on the Kapuas River, and happened to stumble, up, stum stumble upon this uh, festival, this uh, offering uh, festival that was going on. And then it had a spiritual component to me, and then this other figure that I've created is this other individual that's sort of looking for some kind of internal uh, spirituality. And so I'm just sort of, you know, and again, these things, these images were probably made 15 years apart. And so I'm looking at, you know, that kind of connectivity in the way that I approach um, a sort of documentary work and then another way that I approach uh, something that's in, maybe a little bit more internal. There you go, on the Thank left. Thank you. Right. On the left. On right. The right. Ah. <clears throat> so, um, I am sort of a contrarian in many respects in terms of art. I studied with arguably the best, but I also fought with the best. And um, I believe that this quote by Frank Zappa is critically important for all of my students to understand. And what Zappa said was, without deviation from the norm, there can be no progress. If you don't change it up, if you don't try something different, if you don't take a different angle on things, you'll just make more of the same. And then the purpose of culture is pointless. However, I also will add that I would add uh, that not all deviation results in progress because there's a lot of people who choose to deviate for its own sake and just make a mess. And so I don't want to see that become popularized for the wrong reasons. Uh, so this is a picture of uh, Frank Zappa's first uh, album, Freak Out. And I have replaced all of his band members in the Mothers of Invention uh, with my face from different periods of time in my life. And this is me, the mother of ideation. Idea, ideation means idea generation. Um, so these are very small pieces. I don't generally do very small pieces. I do really big pieces. But I, they were both quick thoughts that 
came to me as being important. On the left, my interest in the human experience draws me to particular individuals who do not fit in to the social constructs that they're uh, embedded in and have to either figure out how they're going to negotiate it or how they're going to exit it. Um, so this is Jimi Hendrix. Um, my favorite song of Jimi Hendrix's, uh, and I, my whole family knows this will be played at any memorial service. I have probably in about the year uh, 2075. <laughs> That's my plan, unless, unless I'm really lucky. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, well, you never know. I could luck out and, and not make that. Um, <laughs> so his song was called If Six Was Nine, and it was kind of explaining that things are different than you think. And so I thought about this black guy who grew up in Seattle and uh, was not fitting into that ethnic group that where he uh, grew up. He didn't really see his mother most of his life, didn't see his father until he was about three, and he invented himself as a person who could succeed in a white world which is exceedingly difficult to do. And so I have a lot of admiration for him. And here he is uh, holding a dice that has six uh, spots on one side and nine on the other. And um, this took about an hour and a half to draw and about three days to sculpt because it's three dimensional. On the right is another little um, piece of work. And this is, uh, was done for a show at the Arvada Center uh, as a supplement. And of course, they didn't have a podium, so they didn't put it in there. And I had to come with a podium, and we got that straightened out. Uh, it's a spoof, kind of, uh, or a metaphor, maybe, on the Nancy Drew mysteries. Um, and so my mom had these photographs of my childhood. And everyone always thought that I had the most lonely childhood, except for me. Hmm. I was having a frickin' blast because I wasn't hanging out with children my own age because they were, wanted to play games that were dumb and I didn't like to play games anyway and so I entertained myself as I still do today by making stuff. That's, that's my whole goal in life is to make as much stuff as I can conceive. So I did this drawing here and there's my brother and one of our friends and then there's a void there and that's me. And so I, I guess you could say, this is what other people thought of me, that I just wasn't having any fun. I was a lonely, lonely child. I, I don't see it that way. Great. Uh, while we're talking about wakes, um, th thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> I'm partial to the Rolling Stones. Um, time is on my side. And what a dragon is getting old. So that's good. That'll, those two songs will be at my wake. But hopefully that's a few years away. I'll be sure and appreciate You'll remember them. that. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, so sort of continuing with this idea, I go to Utah quite a bit, and there's a lot of rock art. And so some of the one of the icons of the old peoples, uh, we used to call it uh, Anasazi, but I think the uh, Pueblo people objected to that, but um, is this figure, Cocopelli, and he was the, the flute player. And so he was this sort of uh, allegedly a myth, at least it could be a myth, could be a, a real person, but spending a lot of time uh, maybe as a tradesman or a spiritual uh, leader that was uh, quite um, uh, well known because his, his image is presented in you know, uh, an area of probably over a million square miles in the uh, southwestern U.S. And so I've, you know, on some occasions, uh, I've mimicked his uh, using my shadow, as uh, as sort of mimicking that uh, individual that does that travel. You know, the other images is that would it be a shipwright, Tom. You would probably know that, wouldn't you? Works on small boats in uh, Indonesia, and I had an opportunity to do some travel with some Indonesians uh, on, on a really a spontaneous trip, but. I, I just noticed, and that's one of the things that I think is hopefully all of you guys is that when you start looking at your body of work, if you, if you pull work out that's you know, 20 years old, 25 years old, 30 years old, and what you're doing today, is there some kind, and this is probably somewhat related to wayfinding, is that if you're on this path and you can, the, the basis of your work or the, and the context of your work and, and some, to, to some degree, I think conceptually your work can change. Uh, I think it's, uh, one, what I'm seeing for myself though, is there's a, there's a 
consistency of the form and a consistency of maybe not so much uh, a, a, a visual aesthetic, but more of an emotional or organic or a spiritual aesthetic. And so I think this is, you know, in looking at work, I'm looking for some, 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 something that sort of holds uh, work together. Um, this, you know, this first series, I'm, I'm sort of first few images that I'm showing is really a juxtaposition of fine artwork that uh, that I've exhibited, and then, and uh, as you'll see, a lot of it was done also in Indonesia. And looking at, you know, I, I did an artist residency at the McDowell Colony. At I, actually, I was there. Remember Y2K when everything was supposed to fall apart and your, you know, your ears were going to fall off or whatever? Is that I happened to be in uh, Peterborough, New Hampshire, at the McDowell Colony. It was that was established by Grover Cleveland and Edward McDowell and J.P. Morgan and uh, Aaron Copeland wrote the Rite of Spring there. And so anyway, I did this residency there and and I fell out of trees quite a bit and didn't break anything, but sort of like the juxtaposition, especially of how the feet are in these two images, completely different to context. But I'm you know, looking at some, you know, in the curiosity, this uh, little girl that I uh, met on the river, uh, just one of those profound experiences. We, we caught each other's eye at the same time and just, you know, I'm going one way, she's going the other way down the river. And uh, there was, we were both fascinated by each other. And that was, you know, those are the experiences that you have as an artist, is that when you, when you hit something and you, you nail some kind of idea or some, you hit some kind of emotional vein, that's when it's just, you know, cosmic? We don't say cosmic anymore, do we? Sure. Okay, all right, cosmic. Oh, can I say something about this one? Yeah. Okay. Um, David and I met probably 25 years ago, something like that. Um, I happened to be uh, photographing, uh, doing a photo shoot in an in a, uh, office building downtown and, and, and I knew the curator that uh, is exhibiting this work and David shows up, he's pulling a, you had a, one of those pop top trailers? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You pop it up and it's got a tent, right? And uh, his art was so enormous that it was in the back of that laying flat. So we had five or six pieces or something like that. When I saw this series, you know, I just, I, I just lost it, you know, it, it just, it impacted me so much and the, 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 the not only uh, David's process and his, uh, the, the values that he put on it and the, 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 the somewhat, I wouldn't call it surrealism, but I would say there's a surreal sort of context and, you know, this whole series that David did just, you know, knocked me on my... <clears throat> Anyway, I'll shut up now. That's really all I need to say. No, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so yeah, this is called Van Gogh's Garden, and I need to explain how my process works. It's not the way everyone's process works. We often find out when we're uh, becoming an educated artist that our assumptions about how other people work is not the same as, as theirs. And so for me, here's how it works. Uh, once I was 22 and I gained the confidence that I could do anything I imagined. Then pictures started coming to me like this. Fully developed, not the details, but fully developed. This is what I saw. And so this is a pretty large piece, as you can see. It's um, Van Gogh outside of the uh, hospital in Arles, France, where he spent some time uh, because of his hallucinations and or fill in the blank. The best article I ever read about what his illness was was that he had such a heightened sense of uh, ethics that every minute of his life in the world was painful and that he couldn't find any s s safety in that world and only in nature did he have any respite from that angst that he felt all the time. And it got to, I got to thinking, well, I bet there was a point toward the end of his life where even that wasn't working. So Randy pointed out this sort of surrealistic uh, stuff. Um, I don't consider myself uh, interested in outright realism, even though I studied with photorealists. Um, I do lots of substitutions of images and forms to create a psychological or subconscious effect in the viewers. So the trees that you see here are actually all patterned after electrical discharges. The grapevines in the foreground here are all patterned after shadows of my hands. 
So I would stand in my studio, just like the Renaissance artists did, trying to figure out cool hand gestures, and go, oh yeah, that's it right there. And then I, I, I would draw as, as you see. I, I don't use lines, I use value. And so up close, this would be uh, a hand over here on the right. Uh, and just to, just to be cheeky, I have a branch of this grape going around the ring finger, which would be the fourth finger, or the third finger going that way, there's a thumb. There's absolutely nothing important about that except that these things take me 18 to 24 months to do every dang day, and I get bored. So I have to find ways to keep my momentum. If I, I always wish that the shoemaker's elves would come in at night and finish the stuff because I already see it. And once I'm halfway through it, I know it's going to be what I saw. All the details, however, get made up. All right, uh, again, sort of McDowell Colony on the right. Uh, this is Neos Island and in the Indian Ocean on the, on the west coast of uh, Sumatra. And these guys are, uh, this was a natural geographic moment. Uh, uh, it was me and an anthropologist and a, and a couple of museum curators. And uh, Neos got fairly well by the tsunami of 2004, got fairly well um, split apart. And um, we got invited to go in because they were rebuilding one of the traditional houses in, uh, in this village. And we, we come over a hill in a, in a, in a car and, and we can hear chanting and music. and. Uh, and so we get down in there, and these, these, this village had turned out in our honor because there were uh, Americans coming in. And these guys are, are and, and a, lot of, a lot of native cultures do something really similar to this, and so they're spearmen. And so the way, way in the day that people would uh, satisfy quarrels is that they would have, um, you know, they would come out with their spears and never delivering a fatal blow, but they would point their spears at their, at mostly their lower, lower legs. And whoever uh, got the uh, injury first, uh, uh, received it first, I mean, the other one would win. And so that's how they resolve uh, issues, and this is sort of a reenactment of that. Uh, the McDowell piece is more uh, this sort of sprite or the spirit in the trees. You know, I have a remote control for my camera, and this is back when I was shooting film. And so I could, you know, I could uh, set up my camera on my tripod and do all these uh, acrobatics and, uh, and things and hit, and hit the, the thing and, and keep advancing the film. And so that was, you know, um, and I'm looking at the sort of the, the idea of expression, the idea of, um, of being, you know, in touch with maybe a, a part of yourself that you don't normally are, and of course, these, they don't resolve problems in this way anymore, but it's just sort of an illustration of graphically. Uh, Randy, be quick. Is this on? No. You would ask me to jump in a couple of yeah, times, okay. um, and I, I was, I'm struck by the yin and yang of, of the dual presentation here. It seems, and I'm wondering if you guys could respond to this, it seems, Randy, that your pieces uh, are spiritual and maybe supernatural. Um, and it seems, David, that the pieces that you've shared with us so far, most of them seem to be um, isolated or like the, the sadness. It, it seems like it's almost like a, a positive and a, and a negative, a yin and a yang in the, in the presentation so far. Would, would you guys respond to that? Well, perhaps in my case, it's that sad childhood that everyone thought I had. I was a loner. I did things by myself. I still do. I don't really want to hang out with huge crowds of people. I, my idea of uh, heaven would be a, a garage that's five miles long, has everything in it I need to make anything I conceive of, and I would be happy as heck. I would say similarly on the, on the, on the work, on the studio work that I, I do is, is, is an internal thing, and it's not really, um, um, yeah, it's not done in a, in a sort of a public view. This, you know, uh, I mean, I grabbed my camera and I ran as fast as I could to get into this. And so I think it's, it, you know, it's a di different kind of juxtaposition, you know, because, you know, you know the fine art work is done uh, really uh, uh, individually and, and solely in a lot of different contexts. But what I'm doing this work is that I'm on the front row. And the, the commonality, okay. I think, is the, um, in the ordinariness. 
the you're, you're finding spirituality in the ordinary. Right. Uh, and I think what the pieces that you've shared, David, I, I see uh, sadness or isolation in the mm -hmm. ordinary. Right. But I also see that as spiritual because really we're here as individuals, but we are all one, whether we realize it or not. Right. Thank you. We really recognize it. I did some work for Time Magazine, um, and um, this was back, this was, uh, I think, in the, this had to be late, mid-80s, and uh, so I did quite a bit of stuff in, in Denver uh, protests. This was specifically on the war in Nicaragua and the U U.S. involvement, selling uh, <coughs> drugs for arms, and you know, it was a, pretty much a mess. Uh, the other one is in using the iconography of, of religion and spirituality in context to this other individual who's sort of, uh, sort of dark but rising and um, kind of all-consuming. This is uh, there's a few pieces in here that's in the Denver Art Museum collection, and this is this is one of those. And um, again, I, I like the fact that the or, or the figure is sort of uh, mimicking to some degree the the uh, crosses. So this is the largest drawing I've done to date, though. I will do a bigger one soon, <clears throat> since I get that PhD out of the way. Um, and this is called The Exhaustion of Courage. Um, this came to me in a really unfortunate way, which was that I was having the last exhibit I would ever have at uh, CU Davis's campus on the Auraria campus. And I had decided to put in the Van Gogh drawing into that exhibit uh, because I got a lot of grief from older faculty who <coughs> didn't like a younger guy out exhibiting all of them combined. And that night I'm watching on television uh, one of those inserts, a historic church burns to the ground in Denver. And I just went white because this was the Emanuel Gallery on the Auraria campus. And my little sister had the presence of mind to call the fire department, found out it was another uh, antique building uh, about seven blocks away, and it wasn't, and I thought I'd lost that work, which was two years of my life. Um, I woke up this morning with this image, and it's called The Exhaustion of Courage, and it was how I felt when I had decided to leave teaching at that point, uh, because there was just a lot of, uh, uh, the art world isn't as nice a place as we would like to think. Uh, it's not uh, all one big kumbaya, and I was, uh, tired of a lot of that. So this came to me, uh, I grabbed a model. Most of the models are stand-ins for myself. Uh, Dead Crows, uh, Hindenburg is in there, the disaster of the Hindenburg, the gallery itself, I fabricated this whole thing. One thing I would point out is that in my, the details of my work, I have, I give a lot of thought to it, but what really happens is I have a lot of realizations on a deeper level that go beyond the initial impression that I decide I'm going to draw. And so um, I created what I call this conversational relationship, but one of, the, one of the dying crows here is almost talking to the daffodil. And it's like there's something going on psychologically here between these two things. Interestingly, to parallel off of what Randy was talking about, um, one of my best friends is from El Salvador and he had his father his uh, brother, his brother-in-law, and his 15-year-old little brother, all murdered by the death squads that were um, supported by our government at that time. And I showed this drawing to him, and he just collapsed and wept. And he said it was all about what he had been through, which I didn't think that. But he also told me that the daffodils are called the flores de la muerte, flowers of death, because they're poisonous. And that was just a happenstance. But so I feel like I'm connected to a kind of collective unconscious that helps me make things that are better than I'm capable of. This was done about the time when Nelson Mandela, I mean, the, the, the uh, uprising in South Africa was really coming to a head. And, and I was shooting for Associated Press at that time in their Denver bureau. And uh, so, so did some work. Um, around that. This happened uh, to go national. Um, the other one was, and it's also this, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, sometimes what the hell is this guy doing up there? Um, but it's also a sense of, I don't know, you got any ideas? Why did I put that up I there, I see Tom? restraint. 
like the, the, the way you put these slides together and when we went over them this morning, like uh, the brilliance and how you juxtaposed them, the, the theme that I saw was um, restraint, that whether it be the, the black population of South Africa being restrained by apartheid or in this person, it looks to me like he's being prevented from, from rising. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe he's sometimes, yeah, I mean, Sometimes you don't know, you make work and four years later you figure out what it is. Again, you know, uh, this was in the late 80s. This was in a longhouse in, in Borneo. The longhouse has 30 families living in it. It's a 30-door longhouse. It's, it's one of the traditional ones. It's probably 250 years old. And um, just looking at shapes, and it was, and it was a weaver's uh, longhouse. So most of the, the women in there were, were uh, weavers. And this guy, you know, this is a classic kind of street kind of shot, but I like the idea of the juxtaposition of the shadows and the light and how they connect with both of those images. So I have been studying um, extremism and I have done a whole series of works that deal with extremism and which I see as the perversion of belief systems. Uh, and uh, so this is one of the first ones that I did. It's called uh, The One True Religion. Uh, at the bottom is a kind of a reliquary that shows all the symbols of all the major religions of the world. Here is my niece, Robin, who posed for this. And behind her are crosses that are burning, which are indicative of the KKK, uh, perverting uh, biblical uh, ideas into their own uh, purposes. Um, I um, also had an exhibit in Texas when they approved uh, concealed carry guns could be legally carried by all students in all colleges and junior colleges, private or, prof, uh, or, private or for profit, um, and, um, and public. And I was just horrified. So I did this exhibit uh, called, it was kind of like the gun show, and I built a lot of this stuff. And you can see in the top image there, um, it's called Four God-Given Reasons for Me to Carry a Gun. Uh, the bottom one is called Focus on the Family, based on some ignorant uh, Yahoo stuff uh, expressed by a particular minister. Right. Um, I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I know we're running out of time. I wanna get in, I want to go past these, but you know, different levels of portraiture. I wanna get in, so this is um, a little bit more recent work. I'm working on a piece right, currently on human trafficking, I'm working with the Human Trafficking Center at DU, and then the uh, Human Trafficking Survivors Coalition. And so I'm, it's one of those things where I'm really struggling with it, and so that, um, I, I'm not really sure exactly what the aesthetic of it is yet, but I know there's, and, and the individuals that I've met with and talked to and I've, and I've done some portraits for, there's this, you know, this sense of loss, but it's also uh, uh, I-25 and I-70 are the sort of the, the uh, veins of human trafficking, especially in Colorado, both for human trafficking and um, uh, heroin and cocaine and uh, MS-13, which is one of the major uh, Mexican uh, drug cartels is you know, uh, I-70 I and I-25. So I've been focusing a lot on I-70 and I-25. And some of the, this is a church that was in uh, decay and had been abandoned for many years. And, and um, you know, just looking at those contexts of, of loss and how um, um, the highway is, are we done? One more? 30, okay. 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> So this is um, this really is smacked of a, a lot of uh, issues that we face today. I made a life-size Grand Wizard KKK outfit that fit me like a glove out of tea bag material and tea bags. Um, this is my buddy Baby. Uh, this has to do with the Iraq conflict, and uh, it's all made out of tar. Got some second-degree burn sculpting this. Uh, it also has the dog tags of uh, deceased Iraqi veterans tangled around their legs. This again is the human experience for me. I don't understand why we're doing this stuff, but we're doing this stuff and I have to respond to it. Um, Randy and I had this idea that we would each show, uh, this yeah. is me, that was him, uh, right. but we would each show an image at the end and the other one would analyze it. So right. this is Randy's image that I'm going to analyze. Never seen okay. it before. Oh. Okay, cool. Yeah. Can we take 30 seconds? Okay. Um, 
So when I saw this uh, just now, and as we were putting our presentation together, um, I saw a really interesting uh, metaphor of the window that you can't quite see through, but you can kind of see through. I see this woman here who uh, is very pensive and also uh, seems to be very focused on something. And if I were going to make a wild assumption from all of this, I would say given Randy's work with the human trafficking stuff that this might be a metaphor for that. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It, it, again, it's sort of broken lives, and, and this individual happens to be uh, one of uh, uh, running a nonprofit and a, another human trafficking uh, um, organization that I'm working with. And yeah, so I think there's, I mean, here I'd, I'd like to see intensity, intensity of graphics, and the intensity of, I mean, and, and I think that's the, the common theme for the human trafficking. And everyone that I've talked to, I started on this in about 10 months ago and is, is, is words that keep coming up are loss and shatter and recovery and perseverance, all these things keep coming up. And so I'm trying to weave a narrative around that. And I'm also writing the piece. And you know, I think that's, you know, it, it is. And, and I, we were, you know, David and I were looking at this. And I had another image up here before and on the, the window. And I, at the last minute, I put this one in and David said, oh yeah, that's it. And so that's what I like, you know, the, you know, the collaboration that David and I sort of, did together and, and looking at this. I and thought speaking was, of uh, the yeah. sense of loss, uh, to, yeah. if we yeah, can go to the next yeah. Yeah. slide, yeah. Yeah. it fits perfectly. So here's a, a slide. This is actually a still <clears throat> from an animated poem that I um, created. But I'm going to ask Randy. So tell me the context thinks. of when you did this. I did this in Texas oh, it, two years ago. OK, all right, OK. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's uh, this, this sense of um, of apocalypse. I mean, you don't see a, um, a mushroom cloud forming without thinking about an apocalypse. But seen through, uh, you know, uh, seen through the eyes of the, you know this individual that's actually wearing a, a pair of goggles, which is, you know, sort of uh, has both a. For me, goggles are a protective device. Yeah. And uh, you would expect them to. Um, give you, you know, some kind of protection from the water or from wind or whatever elements that are out there. But I think when I look at this, it's like then you know, the, 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 the goggles almost become a screen by which you're viewing this, almost like a television to some degree. But there's also this sense of imminent destruction that um, um, there's no escape. Yep. So I, a quick uh, aside, and then we'll take questions with the little time we have left. Um, this poem by uh, uh, Jessica Smith, uh, award-winning poet, uh, she contacted me, asked me to do this, and I did. Um, it's the goggles I actually purchased online. They are from the Trinity test uh, of the mm -hmm. first atomic bomb mm -hmm. blast. And I got them, and I actually green screened them while she was wearing them, and then inserted this uh, archival footage of atomic bomb mm -hmm. blasts. Mm -hmm. um, her poem was interesting because it compared the development of the atomic bomb with the development of the Barbie doll. And both of which are rather perverse. Catas <laughs> catastrophic. <laughs> and catastrophic, <laughs> yes. Um, and so she was in her interposed with actual Barbie dolls uh, that were animated, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I, this was a, a shot that I thought kind of summed up the weirdness of where, mm -hmm. what Randy and I grew up with as young men, uh, uh, where we never knew whether we were gonna be alive. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's right. what I got. And I, and I would add to what I said before about at the beginning, I definitely saw the uh, spirituality and, and um, the two sides uh, of spirituality. Um, however, the way it, you guys built it at the end and it came together uh, as a social critique of, of kind of loss of, uh, and a loss of innocence um, from both of you. Okay. So thank you very right. much for, for thank your you presentation. It was our pleasure. Yeah. Yeah.